Welcome to this community town hall from Tulane University uh, talking about COVID vaccines. Uh, we're delighted you could join us. Uh, uh, here in New Orleans, uh, I do want to say that I think the community and the leadership has uh, brought us a long ways uh, in a very helpful uh, manner. Um, and it's a, uh, a really hopeful time. Uh, we've got vaccines on the way, but it's also a time that uh, we've got to keep up a good deal of vigilance because we're in the midst of a surge. Uh, the surge is worse in some parts of the country and actually in many parts of the state. So it's right upon us uh, and we've got to keep being vigilant. Uh, but tonight we're going to focus on the hope that is vaccines. Um, and we're going to have a lot of Tulane experts. Uh, uh, we're going to try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, to begin, um, joining me is the Executive Dean of the School of Medicine, uh, Patrick Delafontaine. Patrick. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ham. It's uh, my turn to welcome you all to this community town hall on COVID vaccines. Um, I think um, it's well known now that the first vaccine has been approved for COVID-19 and is being distributed around the United States. We're gonna hear a lot about vaccines this evening with a panel of experts. There's currently more than 51 vaccines in clinical development and well over 160 vaccines in preclinical development. So a huge amount of activity globally. Um, we're gonna hear about the leading contenders. We're gonna hear about some of the work Tulane University is doing with its uh, vaccine trial. And uh, um, in order to uh, get right into the uh, subject matter, I'm gonna turn the discussion over to Sharon Courtney, who's our head of government relations and uh, is gonna moderate uh, this session. Thank you, Sharon. Good evening, thanks, Dr. De La Fontaine. Um, so I'm gonna start out by introducing our panel. Um, You've met our fearless leader, um, Dean Lee Ham. Um, Dean has been leading the School of Medicine, Tulane and the city of New Orleans through the pandemic with patient care and testing and research on COVID-19. And also you just met Dr. De La Fontaine, who's the executive dean, but he's also the PI, the principal investigator um, on the Tulane Janssen vaccine trial and the organizer of Tulane's COVID research efforts. We also have Dr. Keith Ferdinand, He's a professor and the Gerald S. Berenson Chair in Preventative Cardiology. He's an expert in cardiovascular issues, health disparities, and has been very involved in the state's efforts around vaccines. Uh, Dr. Lisa Marici, Associate Professor and Expert in Vaccines and Adju Adjuvants, I can't talk today, a technology that is used to deliver vaccines. I'll just say that instead. Um, Dr. Dave Mushat, Mush Mushat, I'll just go back to the way I used to say yeah, it. As an associate great. professor, head of infectious diseases for Tulane and the front lines of COVID-19 patient care. Dr. John Shefflin, who's an associate professor and an expert in adult and pediatric infectious diseases and has been also involved in the state's efforts surrounding vaccines. And last but not least, Dr. Bob Gary, who is a professor here at Tulane and an expert on the basic biology surrounding COVID-19 and is a vi virologist. Um, so, Dr. Mushat, can you set the stage with some base information about the state of COVID in general, just to get us started? You bet, Sharon. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. And uh, can everybody see that? Okay, so I'm just going to show you three slides um, to uh, kind of kick things off and, and give a sense of what's going on around the world in the U.S. and Louisiana. So this is the... Um, um, the website at Johns Hopkins University, which has been a wonderful website that compiles data every, uh, pr practically every hour, but certainly every day. And you can see that um, worldwide, there's over 72 million cases of 
uh, COVID-19 that had been diagnosed now. Um, and sadly, um, over one and a half million deaths. If you look at the US on the left here, you can see that we've had over 16 million cases of COVID and we are far ahead of India at about 10 million, Brazil at almost 7 million, Russia two and a half and France a little over 2 million. Let's look at the, uh, the situation locally in Louisiana and, uh, and in the uh, US. So you can see on the left, this is a graph that shows a number of daily cases in the US. And you can see that we are uh, in the middle of a second or third wave or, or surge, uh, as it were. Um, today, um, we sadly passed a, a milestone over 300,000 deaths in the United States as of this afternoon and over 16 million cases. If you look at the graph on the right, it's a similar pattern. You can see that we are in the middle of another uh, surge. There's a little bit of a plateau here. Um, I'm not sure if this may just be the weekend effect when some of the data doesn't come in. Uh, but you can see that over the last 14 days, if you look down here, there's been a 45% increase in cases, nearly 60% increase in deaths, and 42% increase in hospitalizations. So how are things in New Orleans? This is from the New Orleans dashboard as of uh, today. And you can see that since uh, November, there's been a slight increase in uh, daily cases with 87 most recently, it goes up and down, varies from day to day. Fortunately, the number of deaths on a daily basis is still very low. It's typically zero to one deaths um, per day. But you can see here that there's clearly an upward trend uh, in the uh, number of uh, COVID hospitalizations uh, from um, a little over a month ago. You can see that the number of people being admitted to the hospital continues to go up, which reflects what's going on in Louisiana and around the country. And my favorite um, uh, forecast model here, this is from uh, Professor Reich's lab at the University of Massachusetts. It's called the ensemble uh, for, uh, model. And what he does is he combines a number of different models into one, kind of like the ensemble hurricane model, which is used to kind of predict uh, hurricanes. And like hurricane models, it's far from perfect, but it gives you some sense of where we're going. So this is the forecast for Louisiana in terms of the number of cases uh, and what you can see is that if you look at this stash line here, which is roughly right now, you, you can see that looking ahead four weeks, we do expect to peak around the end of December or early January, we'll plateau and then we should start going down. So again, this is a prediction, uh, but in all likelihood, we have a couple more weeks of increases followed by a plateau and then hopefully a slow but steady decline. And so this is the time when we really need to lean in and wear our masks, keep our distance, and get as many people vaccinated as possible. And with that, I think I'll turn it over. Thank you. Dr. Gary, we hear vaccines are a key piece to get us to herd immunity, at least get us there more rapidly. What is herd immunity and how does it work? So herd immunity is where you achieve a sizable portion of the population with immunity to infection. So if somebody gets exposed to the virus, they're then unlikely to transmit it to another person. So it varies for different viruses, but usually we think that about 60%, 60 to 70% of the population needs to be immune so that we can get transmission chains to die out. Now, as you alluded to, there are two ways to get to herd immunity. Um, you can wait for natural infection to roll through the population or you can get to herd immunity with vaccination. So waiting for herd immunity to just spread through the population with SARS-CoV-2 being such a lethal virus, you would have far too many deaths in our vulnerable population. So vaccine immunity is definitely the best way for us to get to herd immunity. Dr. Marucci, I keep hearing about different kinds of vaccines. Can you explain the types of vaccines and the differences if any, among the front runners, and is any one vaccine better than the others? Sure, I'm happy to answer that question, Sharon. You know, I think a lot of people are, are confused because they're hearing about all of these different types of new vaccines. So when people think of vaccines, they typically think of the flu vaccine that they get every year, which is an inactivated form of the flu virus, or they think about MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that we get as, as children that is a live attenuated form of the virus, meaning a weakened form of the virus. 
And so the new vaccines that we're hearing about for COVID-19 are actually based on platforms known as mRNA technology, which stands for messenger RNA. And so the messenger RNA, these are basically tiny pieces of genetic material that carry the instructions to our cells to make proteins. And so our bodies do this naturally. And so this technology has been adopted so that we can deliver a, a piece of the virus on the mRNA to our cells to make a protein that we can mount an immune response to. And then the other technology that we're hearing a lot about, uh, so the mRNA technology is basically the one that Moderna and Pfizer are using. The other front runners would be AstraZeneca, which is, which is partnered with the University of Oxford, as well as the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen trial that, that's also up and running here at Tulane, which uses an adenovirus. And so the adenovirus is a weakened virus that typically causes the common cold, but it's been weakened in such a way that it can't grow in our bodies, but it can deliver a piece of the coronavirus to our cells so that our cells will make that, that protein and present it to the immune system. So the similarities between these front runners, Moderna's, Pfizer's, AstraZeneca's, Johnson & Johnson, is that they're all using some type of technology, whether it be messenger RNA or the adenovirus vector to deliver the spike protein from the coronavirus to our cells so that our cells can make that spike protein and present it to the immune system and hopefully get protected from the, from the infection with the coronavirus. And so the fact that they're all targeting the spike protein is a very good sign because we're seeing that these are probably very good strategies with the current protection data that we're seeing. Um, there are minor differences between the platforms. So for example, we've heard a lot about the mRNA uh, vaccines requ requiring these ultra cold storage uh, facilities. And so that the adenovirus vaccines are less strict with their storage requirements. And so that will be good because we'll be able to deliver those to more rural areas and other parts of the world that may not have the capacity for these ultra, uh, ultra cold freezers. Um, and then in, in terms of whether anyone is better than the other, you know, what we're seeing is that the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are both about 95% uh, protective. Um, and we think that these adenovirus platforms, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson will also be highly effective. We're still waiting on some of the data from AstraZeneca. We've seen reports on average 70% protection, but I think once they adjust the dosing, it'll, it'll, it'll go up. To perhaps 90%. And then we're still waiting on the efficacy data from Johnson & Johnson. But I'm very hopeful that they're all going to be very good. And so I would rec recommend getting any one of those if it's made available to you. Dr. Mushat, how many vaccines are approved and how many are currently in the pipeline? Dave, you're muted. Still, still muted. There. There we go. Okay. So let me just show you a slide that I have that summarizes where we are with the vaccines. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So, um, the good news is that we are in a great position right now. We have at least 58 COVID-19 vaccines in human clinical trials. And as you can see on the left, um, they, um, they're in various stages of development. So there's four, at least 40 that are in very early stages uh, in humans. And if you look up to phase, out to phase three, which is where um, the Pfizer and Moderna studies have been recently, there's 15. And then there was a bunch that are actually in limited use um, approved. And there's actually one that was abandoned. So the, the, the table here at the right really sums up uh, what we're dealing with right now. I have uh, put these stars next to the four leading candidate vaccines that we'll be seeing in the United States in the next weeks to months. So we've already heard about the FISO, Pfizer BioNTech, which has received emergency use authorization and is actually being deployed in New Orleans as we speak. The Moderna one should be approved very soon, perhaps this week or next week. And then we have the Johnson & Johnson and the Oxford AstraZeneca. 
and uh, Dr. Marisi has already pointed out the different uh, platforms. The good news is that um, these will be coming out sequentially. And, the, and what will happen is by having more vaccines, we will have greater uh, manufacturing capacity to get out a lot of vaccine doses uh, quickly. Uh, and so that, um, you know, if we start out with one, we can only produce so many vials of vaccine, but once you get up to four, you can produce a lot more and this will help get um, more and more Americans uh, vaccinated. Um, as Dr. Marisi said, the, the first two seem to have um, effectiveness of about 95%, which is way above the 30 to 50% that we were initially hoping for. The Johnson and Johnson and Oxford AstraZeneca, the jury's still out, but probably at least uh, ironically, the Oxford vaccine, uh, some of the doses were given at half the intended dose and they actually gave better protection, about 92%. And so now that, that dose is being studied. So all in all, very optimistic uh, situation. You can see there's some other vaccines being used in Russia and China. Um, the jury is still out on those, but we hope that they're effective and others that will be coming our way. So I think that we'll have more than enough vaccines in the next few months to serve the needs of the American population. Thank you. Thanks, we're starting to get questions in from our audience. And so the first one I'm gonna uh, give to Dr. Ferdinand. Um, the question is, I am 70 years old, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor and a triple bypass survivor. Will my primary care physician be the one I should speak with regarding the vaccine? You should always speak with your primary care physician about any medical intervention. However, the vaccine is probably going to be especially for Pfizer because of the cold temperatures and some of the nuances and how it's given, be done at major centers. That person who is high risk, and I'm not speaking about any one individual because you can't do that on a Facebook call, but a person who is very high risk probably would get the best benefit because if that person is infected, their chances of hospitalization or even death are increased. So those are older persons and persons with other conditions, including heart disease, cancers, previous stroke, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, obesity. So persons who are high risk, especially the older persons are the ones that we really need to target. One question that arises, well, why give it to the doctors and the nurses? They're not, they're not old and they're not sick because our healthcare service delivery system would collapse if we had multiple physicians, nurses, technicians, the caseworkers, the custodial workers, if all of them got sick, there'll be no one to care for someone. So we're getting the persons who institutionalize long care delivery centers, but you also need to treat the caregivers, the custodial workers, the caseworkers, the people who are working in those facilities, or we'll have no one to care for the ill. Thank you. Dr. De La Fontaine. You're the principal investigator on the Tulane, Tulane Janssen vaccine trial. So first of all, you might should explain to everyone what principal investigator means. And we have several people who've asked questions related to that. Can you tell us about the current status of the trial? Uh, sure, thank you very much. Uh, so the um, Johnson and Johnson vaccine trial, as Dr. Mushad just showed us, is one of the, the top four contenders currently. and. Uh, based on a, a viral uh, construct. Um, uh, the trial is close to clinical recruitment. Um, uh, the, the definition of principal investigator is the lead investigator at Tulane. Uh, the, the trial is being done across eight countries. Uh, it has recruited approximately 40,000 participants. And we are recruiting uh, in the United States until the uh, the end of Thursday, actually 9 p.m. this Thursday, uh, um, next, this week, it's actually the last, uh, the last uh, uh, enrollment, uh, and the results should come out in January, and we expect, and the company is stating that they're going to be filing for emergency authorization for the uh, third week or fourth week of January. So I think we'll be getting the results pretty quickly. We're hoping that, that it will be as effective as the uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccine. Um, one difference with this vaccine is unlike the others, uh, it only requires one injection. And that is a, uh, a significant advantage 
uh, as far as getting um, the vaccination, um, uh, particularly uh, in uh, hard to reach communities, rural communities, uh, where it may be more difficult for folks to return to, um, uh, to get the second shot. So um, uh, uh, we're, uh, we're excited about this. Uh, uh, anyone that is interested in participating, um, the website is vaccine at tulane.edu, or you can call 988 0200. Uh, we will be enrolling until, uh, until the end of the day, Thursday. Great. So we've got a few more questions from um, our viewers. Um, so this would be for um, either Dr. Gary or Dr. Marici. Is there a problem giving the Moderna vaccine to an immunosuppressed person? Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> well, the, you know, we, we should probably um, have the clinicians answer this, but to my knowledge, the, the, the emergency use authorization is, um, you know, I don't know if it takes into account, for example, people with HIV. Dave, John, would you like to jump in there? Yeah, sure, um, Lisa. So the um, Pfizer study did include some people with HIV. Um, in fact, the HIV community lobbied to be included after initially not being included. And, and it appears to be safe and effective, but it's in that population. Um, you know, it may not be, it, it, there's not much data on people with advanced HIV AIDS and very immunosuppressed persons. And so I think the jury is still out on that. We need to see more data. Yeah, and if, I'll, I'll just add that it, neither of these vaccines, neither the, the Moderna nor the Pfizer are live vaccines. So theoretically they would be mm -hmm. safer, but again, we don't have the, the safety data. And I, I think it's also important to point out that that includes pregnant women as well, or women who are planning on becoming pregnant soon. There isn't data yet. The, um, the emergency use authorization didn't specifically mention pregnant women, but most people and most facilities, including ours here at Tulane, are offering the, um, the vaccine to our pregnant healthcare workers, should they choose to take it. Uh, Dr. Shifflin, um, there's another question from the audience, which is, is there a problem? Oh, wait, sorry, we just did that one. Um, I'm allergic to penicillin. Would I be allergic to the vaccine? So there's no penicillin in the vaccine. Um, when you go and, and get the vaccine, they will ask you if you are allergic to any of the, the components that may be in that particular vaccine, and they can outline it. But as long as you haven't had any kind of reaction to a, a vaccine preservative in the past, uh, you should be fine. These are, I'll, I'll be honest, these are unique formulations, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer. Um, they probably have uh, unique preservatives that um, are very likely never been um, used before outside of these trials. So based on what we know from the trials, they are safe and um, efficacious, although you're, you're likely to get a sore arm from it, but not much more. Dr. Ferdinand, we've heard a lot in the media about vaccine skepticism. Can you talk about why people are so, so skeptical of taking the vaccine? Well, vaccine skepticism comes from different areas. Uh, let me first talk to the one that's specifically related to African-Americans and other racial ethnic minorities. Before we as physicians say that the patients are just ill-educated, we need to understand that there's been a deep level of mistrust and even stronger distrust in the Black community. And some of it is related to the fact that if you go back to the 1800s, it was actually traditional Orthodox medicine that were the apologists for slavery. And indeed, some of the fathers of gynecology, if you want to use that term, practiced on enslaved women to hone their craft. Fast forward even to the 1960s, there were segregated wards in most of the major hospitals. Some physicians would have only certain days they would see black patients. And we all know about some of the studies such as the Tuskegee experiment in which patients were denied penicillin even when it became available. That being said, what I say to my patients and we've had several community fora so far is that in 2020, 
there are some devices that are in place, including institutional review boards. These are not people from the company, they're outside the company and looking in. You also have the data and safety monitoring board. These are persons who are not doing the study. They're just looking at the data to make sure that there's nothing unusual going on. You have the FDA, not the political arm of the FDA, but advisors that will come in and look at the data. And then the CDC also has external advisors who don't work for the government. So there's so many different layers, plus sunshine is the best disinfectant. I really believe looking at some of the data that's present now, these vaccines appear to be safe and effective. The 35 pages of the Pfizer submission are available online, cdc.gov, your tax dollars at work. And you can actually see that 9.7% of the patients were African-American and there were no worse side effects in that particular population and the benefits appeared to be the same. The Johnson & Johnson study that we're doing is indeed a clinical trial. So half the people are getting placebo or saline, you know, just water. The other half are getting the active Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So we can't really say that it's going to be equally as effective across all populations. But one of the reasons we are having these type of public community events is to say that we want to have a population that's very diverse so that if the vaccine is approved and we expect it will be, we can be confident that it reflects the heterogeneous or mixed population that we have here in the United States. And then there are some other people who are just anti-vaxxers. They're against any kind of vaccine. They probably are not old enough to remember kids coming to school with shriveled legs, unable to walk because of polio or kids dying in early childhood with measles. But I do remember that. Vaccines have been a great human development. The science of vaccines has actually improved. And we have all of these various ways now in which we attempt to ensure safety with these clinical trials. I think the data are starting to accumulate that this is going to be one of the main ways that we can get out of this pandemic. One more point, it only take about 30 seconds. I lay up at night. I never could figure out because Americans have this crazy freedom from masks and they want to go where they want to go and hang in the bars and go with, do whatever they want to do with whom they want to. I couldn't figure out how we're going to get out of this. We're going to get out of this by finally doing the public health measures, but the vaccine is going to be a great help for that particular way of getting out this pandemic. As a follow-up, and you may have talked about this a little bit, um, so but I'm going to ask you to expand on it. I know that you're involved in some programs to help alleviate concerns by conveying trusted information. Can you tell us about those groups and what they're doing? Well, the Louisiana governor has a Louisiana Health Equity Task Force, and the dean appointed me to represent Tulane on that. We also have a Louisiana Vaccine Commission. NIH also has another commission that's looking at that. And then I, just as a good citizen, I'm a native of New Orleans, I'm interested in the welfare of the people of the community. And what we're looking at is to make sure that these vaccines are safe and effective, that political influence doesn't rush out the vaccines. And from the data that I've seen, I'm coming increasingly confident that not only are the vaccines safe and effective, but they're going to be something that's very important for us to overcome this pandemic. And it would be a shame if because of the terrible history of racism and oppression that black people have had, that we don't use this opportunity to take advantage of these vaccines. Thank you. Dr. Mushat, will it be recommended for those previously infected with COVID to get the vaccine? And what does the current data suggest based on long-term immunity for those previously infected, especially for those that were asymptomatic? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. Um, at this time, um, it, whether you've had the infection or not, you should get the vaccine if you're, you know, if you're in a high risk group. Um, and there's probably two reasons. One, first of all, um, it seems to be safe for you to receive the COVID vaccine, even if you've had COVID-19 before, about 10 to 15 percent of the trial participants in the Pfizer study are believed to have had COVID previously, and they seem to do just fine. But the other reason is that it may be that the vaccine will further strengthen your immunity. You know, for some infections, natural infection, the actual infection is better than the vaccine. And for some infections, the vaccine is better than natural infection in terms of protecting you. And it's not quite clear with this infection which way it's going to go. But the thinking is that, um, you know, we know that some people who have COVID-19 don't have 
a strong an antibody or immune response. And so therefore they may benefit uh, from getting um, that, that uh, vaccine. Dr. Marici, once we're vaccinated, how will individuals know whether the vaccine has worked on us? Will we need antibody tests? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, we're going to know a lot in the next couple of months. Um, you know, so the, the early readouts are that it's 95% effective. Um, I think we're, all, we're also going to have to, you know, wear masks. Um, again, we, you know, we don't know. So what we do know is that these early vaccines are pre preventing, you know, mild to symptomatic disease as well as severe disease. What we don't know is whether these vaccines are eliminating infection or carriage of the virus and transmission to others. And so it's gonna be critically important that everyone, even if you're vaccinated, that you assume that you can still transmit the virus to other people. And so it's important that even though you're vaccinated and hopefully protected from disease, that you still protect others by wearing your mask. Because it's going to take, I think, um, a lot of, uh, of months of study and it's going to take everyone, as Dr. Ferdinand has mentioned, everyone doing their part and getting vaccinated to achieve herd immunity, to suppress the virus to such low levels that it's no longer being transmitted in the community. I'm just not sure it's feasible to do follow-up antibody tests on everyone that's been vaccinated and to assume if you have antibodies, you know, that you're protected next month, two months, three months down the road. Um, we, we think these vaccines are going to be effective for a long time and that you'll be protected for a long time. But again, it's a community effort. It's not an individual effort. We have to all get vaccinated. And until it's safe in our community, then we're all safe. Sharon, can I say something? Uh, many of the anti-vaxxers will always say that the doctors and the scientists don't know what they're doing because they say perhaps. And, and Lisa used that word a lot. That is not because we somehow don't know what we're doing, but it's a sign of honesty that it's going to take time before we know how long the vaccine lasts, whether or not you can still transmit the virus. That type of honesty is perhaps something that people are not used to, but that does not mean that the science is somehow ill-informed. It will take hundreds of thousands of persons before we can make foreign decisions on whether or not you still can infect someone if you've had the vaccine and then you're exposed whether or not the vaccine will stop you from dying if you get the infection. We just don't know a lot of those things, but that's not because somehow we're ill-informed. That's the nature of science, that we will make balanced statements and we'll use that word perhaps. The anti-vaxxers will say, well, they don't know what they're talking about. You hear that? She's not even sure. Well, she's being honest. <laughs> yeah, Sharon, if I can just add one more thing. <clears throat> I think it's also really important for people to understand that the, uh, you don't have immediate protection after you get that first dose. It takes time for your immune system to, to respond and do its job. And you really need, if it's a two dose vaccine, you need to get both doses. And, you know, everybody will get, you know, some people will get protection between the first and the second dose, but really that protection maximizes a couple weeks after the second dose. So even if you get vaccinated, it doesn't mean that you can rip off that mask and go to the bars and go wherever you want, you still have to do your part and protect yourself and protect the people around you. I have to wait to hug random strangers on the street. That's okay, right. got it. Um, okay, Dr. Shiflin and Dr. Mishat, what does the 95% and 92% protection from the vaccine represent? Are these patients exposed I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this in the text. Are these patients exposed to the virus that do not get sick, or is it the percentage of patients that continue to test negative after a set period of time? Well, my understanding is it's, it, it's based on whether they get sick or not. Uh, however, I know they are, in some of the studies, they are also doing um, testing. Uh, PCR and antibody testing, because there's two issues here. One is that what we've so shown to date is that these vaccines do protect us from getting sick and being hospitalized and dying. What we don't know is whether or not these vaccines prevent us from getting the virus in our body. Mm -hmm. It's still possible we might get some virus in our nose or in our throat and not get sick and never get sick, but we might transmit it to somebody else. And so that's going to take a little bit longer to 
uh, figure out, but that, that scientists are working feverishly at uh, looking at that very issue because, and you know, the track record with other vaccines generally is such that if it prevents disease, it tends to prevent mm. transmission as well. John, anything to add? Uh, I think the only thing I'd add just for, to help people interpret what those numbers mean is in, for example, the Pfizer study, they enrolled over 44,000 people. Half of them got the vaccine, half of them got the placebo. If you assume that, that the, both groups of people were exposed generally these, to the same degree, the chance of the people getting vaccinated, the people who got vaccinated of them getting sick was decreased by 95% compared to the placebo group. So none of those people were, were exposed on purpose. They just went out into the world doing their daily business. They just had a significantly lower chance of developing any kind of COVID related illness than those who just got the placebo. Dr. Shefflin, we heard your comment a few minutes ago that pregnant nurses will be allowed the vaccine. When will we, I think that's what you said, when will we know the general public know more details about safety for pregnancy and breastfeeding? So the, uh, it's my understanding that several of these studies, including the uh, Pfizer, are now doing follow-up studies and they're looking at the uh, potential impact on pregnant women. Those are always difficult studies to do and, and challenging to do for um, just logistical and ethical reasons, but I think that's more and more data is going to come out. Um, you know, on all of these studies, when you enroll lots and lots of people, so for example, 44,000 people, um, it's chances are women do get pregnant as they did in that Pfizer study. So they'll be following those women closely, making sure that they did well and that their infants did well. Um, you know, the other thing is, I think people have referred to before, especially Dr. Delafontaine, that things are moving very quickly. We're trying to get these vaccines out quickly, get these phase three studies done quickly. We can't make a pregnancy happen faster, right? We still need nine months to figure out how, what the result of that pregnancy is. So unfortunately, it's gonna be a real challenge to speed up that data acquisition and, and understand fully uh, what the safety is for pregnant women. Dr. Gary, I have a two-part question for you. The first part is, how long do we think vaccines will protect us? So it's very likely that we'll be protected for at least a year, hopefully longer. I mean, since the SARS virus is so, SARS-CoV-2 is so new, and since the vaccines are new, we don't know for sure. What we do need to do is to get a high portion of the world's population immune to this virus so we can stop the pandemic. And I can assure you that we'll do whatever it takes to get that done. And as a follow-up, what happens when the virus mutates? Could a vaccine become ineffective? So probably not. Uh, coronaviruses like the SARS-CoV-2, they're not influenza viruses. They don't reassort and produce viruses with entirely new sets of genes. But all viruses do mutate. And so we need to be vigilant about the mutations and look for any that could impact vaccine efficiency. Now, the good news about that is, is that we will be able to respond. We can modify the vaccines very quickly. These new platforms can be changed and we'll be able to respond if a vaccine, uh, if a mutation in the virus should arise that impacts the vaccine efficacy. Dr. Ferdinand, is each vaccine a one size fits all given the fact that it said that African Americans are affected by the virus more than other groups? Well, we don't know. But again, that's not because we're ill informed. We need to make sure that the populations that are included in the studies are representative. And in the Pfizer study, it was 9.7% African American out of 44,000. The results in terms of production and the side effects appear to be the same as the general population. Moderna has gotten about 10% of the population. And I know Dr. Delafontaine has made a very strong effort over the last week or so to go to the African-American community here in New Orleans to make sure that he has a representative sample. I would expect that the results will be the same but the only way to prove that is to make sure that you have a representative sample. 
The reason African Americans have more hospitalization and death from COVID-19 is probably not driven by biology. It's probably driven by what they call the social determinants of health, people who are essential workers, the cashiers, the bus drivers, people who don't get early testing, multi-generational homes, perhaps waiting to go to the hospital because they don't have insurance or their insurance copay may be too high. There's just a lot of factors why people are hospitalized and die from COVID-19. And similar to what we see in heart disease and cancer and diabetes, these disparities are unmasked by COVID-19, but I'm not convinced that COVID-19 causes these disparities. Perhaps I could add, in addition to what Dr. Ferdinand said, that um, uh, although these vaccines have been developed extraordinarily fast, um, there's been no shortcut to patients. Uh, and, and that's sometimes uh, difficult to sort of realize because if you look at the normal uh, time to develop a vaccine, it's closer to 10 years than one year. And here we are uh, 10 months after the start of this pandemic in the United States and, uh, and worldwide, uh, about a year after. And we have a whole series of vaccine candidates, one of which is already approved, a second which is likely to get approved in the next week or so. And, and uh, there's many reasons for that, but there's no shortcuts that have been taken. These have been very rigorous studies uh, that have involved tens of thousands of folks. Um, the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson study actually has 17% of African-Americans uh, or Blacks, if you will, uh, worldwide included. So it's gonna be a, an important trial uh, when the results come out in uh, next month. And um, uh, and, and I, I also want to add that um, all vaccines are going to have some differences, but uh, when they asked the specific question to Dr. Fauci, um, his response was, well, yes, but um, it is so important to do two things to take care of this pandemic. Number one, keep up with the social distancing, masking, and healthcare guidelines that we've all heard about so much. And number two, get vaccinated buy a vaccine that has actually gone through the rigorous testing and been approved um, in the United States, of course, by the FDA. And I think we're, we're uh, fortunately in that situation where uh, we will, um, we have a vaccine approved and we're gonna have uh, hopefully several approved over the next uh, month or two, uh, which will allow us to get to uh, hopefully a situation of uh, herd immunity the, the right way uh, in the next six to seven months. Um, uh, I'll remind uh, everyone, and again, to follow up on um, some of Dr. Ferdinand's comments, and, and I will, uh, I do want to give a shout out to Dr. Ferdinand. He's done a, a tremendous job over the last uh, couple of weeks, and particularly the last week in uh, reaching out to um, the African-American community in New Orleans and helping us um, address some of the misinformation uh, and some of the concerns relating to vaccines. Um, but I think Dr. Ferdinand um, reminded us about some of this information and misinformation and um, some of the discussions around herd immunity and, and should we let herd immunity just happen the natural way? Well, I think Dr. Gary highlighted the fact that we've lost over 300,000 people, unfortunately, in the United States now. But if we let herd immunity run its course, um, we would be losing millions. Um, and so comparing this, um, this infection to the flu, which is another source of misinformation that has happened, unfortunately, nationally, some people have said, well, it's not that worse than the flu. Well, um, a week or so ago, um, Jeff Asher had a very nice article on Tikayun, where he looked at the number of folks in Louisiana that have died from COVID-19 across the 10 parishes that have had the most infection and compared those numbers to people that have died from cancer and heart disease. And in that article, he shows very nicely that the numbers are pretty similar. And if you look at the number that have died from the flu, it's 
five-fold to ten-fold lower. So this is a, a very bad disease. Uh, the vaccines are, are going to be life-saving uh, with the public health measures um, that we are going to have to follow for at least another six months um, as we deal with this pandemic. I would just add to that as since my day job is advocacy, I think it shows uh, the power of harnessing uh, the world scientific community um, and the research funds to accomplish something is another reason we got here so fast. It's like, you know, it shows what we could actually do um, in a lot of areas. Um, um, so Dr. Shifflin, uh, Dr. Mouchette, how long do you have to wait to receive the vaccine after COVID or any other illness? Well, as I said earlier, COVID is not a reason not to get it. Um, the CDC right now does not have an official answer to that. They, they're saying there's not enough data. I have seen it said in the past that if you had um, COVID within 90 days, you might want to wait, but currently that's not even on their website as far as I know. Um, and so I, you know, if you had COVID a few weeks ago, I probably wouldn't get it. But if you had it two or three months ago, I probably would get it. Um, I don't think there's a reason not to. I think there's a sort of a myth that you can't get vaccines when you're sick. Um, certainly, we don't like to give people a vaccine if they come into clinic and they have a temperature of 102, because then we don't know if the vaccine is when they get that fever the next day, is it, is it the vaccine or their underlying illness? But if you have a temp of 100 or 99.9 or a little sore throat or you're feeling under the weather, that's probably not a good enough reason not to get vaccinated. It's more important to get vaccinated when you have the opportunity than to use these excuses not to get vaccinated because that vaccine, getting it today instead of next week could save your life. Um, we have a question in the chat and I'm not sure. I think there's a couple of you who can answer this. But when can we expect to see the vaccine become available for um, the general population? That, that's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll try and take a stab at this one. Um, so I, I've been fortunate enough to be part of the state's vaccine action collaborative and we um, came up with a, a suggested prioritization of how different groups within our society should be vaccinated and what order is vaccine becomes available. So a lot of people, as I think was mentioned earlier, what the people we consider essential workers, people that work in pharmacies, grocery stores, bus drivers, um, they're, as being considered essential workers, they will get it before, for example, I hate to say it, college students, who that's probably really, the healthy college student is probably going to be pretty last on the list. Um, so it, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer, but as time goes by and more and more vaccine becomes available, I think it'll be pretty readily available, hopefully by March, April, I think is, I'm, maybe I'm being optimistic, I hope not, but I think that's a reasonable expectation. I think, um, I think I could add to what Dr. Shipman said that the current estimates um, and it is a little difficult to know exactly what's going to happen, but the current estimate is that we'll get 20 million doses in December. And actually that's 20 million people vaccinated. So that's two doses, um, 30 million in January and 50 million in February. So if all goes as planned, hopefully we'll have 100 million people in the United States vaccinated by the end of February, early March. And I would think that we can then pretty quickly, hopefully move to all the, even the lower risk uh, groups. Yeah, Dr. Fauci said today he was thinking uh, March or April. So I'm, I've marked that on my calendar. Um, so we have our first sort of provocative question um, from the audience. This will be for Dean Ham. I'll let him take this one. Um, honesty and transparency are key values, but there has been some damage by certain politicians to public trust in science and medicine. How do we overcome this reality? Well, thank you for giving me an easy question. <laughs> huh? uh, that's a really tough question. You know, um, I do think, uh, 
trust and transparency are extraordinarily important. You know, let me let me mention one of the things, you know, you've heard a number of people refer to Dr. Fauci. And Dr. Fauci himself, some people have raised questions about that. But many of the people on the panel, and they can nod their heads yes or no in a minute, the reason people on the panel trust him so much is he's been doing the same thing for years, advocating for the health of the nation and investigating viral illnesses and working to eliminate viral illnesses, whether it's HIV or Ebola or whatever. He's been that trusted person at the NIH working across for decades that has uh, been selfless and really uh, uh, has, has built that for much of the scientific and medical community. So that's why, so it, it is, and I'm not gonna tell you how to grow to trust politicians. I just, I can't go there, um, but, um, I hope you have a doctor you trust, a nurse you trust, a pastor you trust that maybe has spoken to a trusted doctor. Um, you know, I think someone that has educated themselves about this will know sort of the things that you're hearing tonight, that the vaccine has been tested in literally tens of thousands of people and that it is as safe as a vaccine can be developed to be. You know, we've, we've been watching questions arise on the screen and it said, well, um, you know, some people after certain vaccines have died. Well, when you test it in elderly people, you know, and you, look out over two to three months and you've tested thousands, the natural course is that some of them may have heart attacks or strokes unrelated to that. And it was a very few, but, and it was unrelated to the vaccines. So, you know, I would ask your doctor or nurse friend, would they take the vaccine? I'd love to see if would anybody on the panel, would everybody on the panel take the vaccine? Absolutely. You know, there's no hesitancy. Um, and which vaccine? Whichever one, you know, right now it's the Pfizer. Hopefully next week and next month we'll begin to get the next one, the Moderna. You know, a month or so after that, it may be one of the others. You know, they have gone through a very rigorous process. And so uh, um, I hope the physicians by and large across the country have been very supportive of uh, the efforts that have been underway. Uh, the physicians and scientific community. So anyway, um, I guess that's what I would say. Well, thank you, Dean Ham. I thought that was beautifully put. Um, Dr. Marici, just to sort of a follow up on that, can you address um, some of the conspiracy theories and people with autoimmune conditions um, and the vaccine? Thank you, Sharon, for asking that question. There has been a tremendous amount of conspiracy theories on social media, on Facebook. Uh, there are numerous things out there that look legitimate. They look like they're scientific and factual, but in fact, they are fictitious. I've seen things like the vaccine is going to cause uh, females to become infertile. I've seen that, they've, they've, you know, that, the, that the vaccines are going to integrate into our DNA. Let me just very quickly explain to our audience why that is so far-fetched. So our cells in our body at any point in time 
contain hundreds of thousands of copies of messenger RNA. So when we deliver this Pfizer or this Moderna mRNA vaccine to our cells, it's a drop in the ocean in terms of what our cells are seeing. And furthermore, once that messenger RNA gets into our cells and our cells make that spike protein and present that protein to the immune system, that messenger RNA is rapidly degraded. It doesn't hang around. It's not integrating into our DNA. The same thing with the adenovirus. The adenovirus has been designed to deliver the material to our body, but that virus itself cannot replicate in our bodies. It cannot cause disease and it is rapidly degraded. So please, please follow up on what Dean Ham said. If you see something on social media that discourages you or scares you about these technologies, talk to your healthcare provider. They will explain it to you that it is safe. And furthermore, I know the community feels like these vaccines have been rushed. And, and Dr. Delafontaine explained that no corners were cut, no safety corners were cut. But what I'd also like the community to know is that these vaccine technologies, while they appear new to the public, They've been in development for 30 years. Scientists have been advancing these platforms and tweaking them and improving them and getting them to the point where they were ready to be put into humans. They were designed for this purpose to respond rapidly to a pandemic. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ferdinand, I think we just have one more question. I'm gonna, time for one more. I'm gonna give this one to you. Is it safe for African-Americans with diabetes and high blood pressure to receive the Pfizer and other vaccines or cancer survivors? Yes. The proportion of people who have these, they call them comorbid conditions. These are conditions along with their general health that will make them at higher risk for having all sorts of complications from COVID-19 these are the persons who are protected the most because when they become infected, they have more hospitalization and unfortunately more death. So yes, if you have those types of comorbid conditions, you're the ideal person. I would say it remains an individual choice. I never would try to convince a person or tell a person they must have the coronavirus vaccine. It's an individual choice that he or she must make. But if you look at the data, the people who do the best are the persons who have those comorbid conditions. Thank you. Um, we have more questions, but not enough time to answer them. So um, you can go to medicine.tulane.edu um, and you will find both the video, the recorded video of this, as well as um, a list of, of FAQs. And we'll make an effort to answer all the questions that we didn't get to this evening. Um, thanks to everybody on the panel for being here tonight, um, and thanks to all the people who were here to, to view it. Um, hopefully, they'll take this back and share the news with their friends and colleagues. Good night, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Continue Good night. being safe. And get your vaccine. <laughs>